Hey everyone, my name is John Grimsmo, and in this episode of Knife Making Tuesday, we're going to talk about Eric's new sharpening technique, we're going to talk about vibratory finishing for, to give the stonewashed finish on the knives, and uh, whatever else we can find around the shop here. Let's take a look. See my nice sticker? Pretty cool, huh? So Eric's got a blade here that he just acid etched and uh, sharpened, and it's got a nice little burr on it, and it doesn't feel very sharp yet. But he assures me that stropping it will get that burr off and make it insanely razor sharp, like all of our knives are. <laughs> So this is a two, knife dogs. Yes, yeah, a knife dog's belt. It was two by seventy-two. But we cut it in half to one by seventy-two. And uh, you're loving it, huh? I love it. Where'd you put it? Yeah, it's a leather belt, basically. And you got some stropping compound on there. Yep. Yeah, I reapply every once in a while. Very scientific. So you're spinning the belt backwards. Yeah, so it goes that way. Away from me so I don't get blade lodged in my belly. So I can see you've got a very precise angle on that. Yep, very uh, exact. Not by feel whatsoever. Can you feel it though? Um, sometimes. On the front edge you can feel it a lot more because it's a lot bigger. Yeah. Actually on that, show me that edge. I can see the burr a lot from there. Yeah, Eric's actually bending it over right now. Yeah. What belt did you sharpen on previously? Um, I think it's an A65. A65, is it a Micron or? Um, Trizac. A Trizac, and he cut it into one inch strip. Yeah. So it's like 220 grit or something okay. maybe? Yeah, and I just go from that belt straight to strapping. And trust me, they're sharp. Yeah. You can still see some of the grain after it's done. Yeah. But I figure the knife is supposed to be sharp. It's not... It doesn't have to be pretty. I mean, it is. It but, is, but... Yeah, we're not... That's not the goal. We're not putting extra minutes and effort into making it a polished edge just to make it a polished edge. Yeah. Even though it is very, very shiny. So everybody's probably wondering, why aren't you wicked edging these anymore? Watch. Yeah, let's watch this. Is it burning it? No, it's is that the, just the, the compound? compound. I think I might have the belt going backwards again compared okay. to what I normally do, so it's rubbing more compound off than it should. Yeah. No. There it is. Okay. You gonna fix it or? Meh. So yeah, I just do this until there's no burr on either side anymore, and if you get the light angle just right, like here, you can see the edge as you're stropping it, so you can kind of watch it form and then disappear. And you're just evening out that burr side to side. Yep, back and forth, bending it off until it's gone. Kind of like you have a piece of metal that you're trying to split in two and you just bend it back and forth, back and forth until it's gone. Or until it breaks in half. Yeah. It's more time spent stropping than I thought it would be. Yeah, I think it... I spend more time stropping than sharpening. Well, whatever just works, right? Because this is the finishing. Yeah. I'm sure if I went up on the belts a little bit before yeah. stropping, like did two belts instead of just one, it might be faster. Cool. But I'm lazy. 
So why no more Wicked Edge? Uh, it just it took too long, especially since I'm trying to find the edge and make it. When we milled them, some of them are a little bit thicker at the edge than others, so it just it took a long time to get to an actual burr um, on along the whole edge, and some of the angles didn't work quite right with like the recurve and everything. So I'd kind of reshape the blade a little bit using the yeah. Wicked Edge. Whereas this, I can follow exactly the shape that we meant it to be. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. And of course with this, it's a powered option, a motor powered option. So like, you put a belt on there and it just grinds away. Whereas the Wicked Edge, you know, he's pumping his hands on every stroke just to scrape away metal. Um, yeah, this is a lot less physical. I just kind of have to stand here and... Yeah. Keep my hands even. Use your mad crazy skills to uh, to do it right. Cool. Well, let's see. Of course, it's compound all over it. So. Yeah, and Eric mentioned that he likes to always put the belt on so it rotates in one direction. Not, you know, if we flip the belt over, because that'll uh, rub the compound off. That's right. Oh, there. right there, especially, yeah. Uh, this likes to always swing one way, but if you start swinging it the other way, it can mess you up. Well, because it's holding on to all the excess compound. Yeah. And then going the other way, it just kind of brushes sense. it right off. So and I, I think the etch blades actually grab on to more of the compound. I don't know if you ever put an arrow on it or not. No, I didn't. Yeah. Back to, uh, I'm lazy. Mm. I don't know if it's sharp. Almost got oh. a little bit of a dull spot. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know guys. Does that qualify? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. I think we're good. <laughs> Let's see here. All right, I know some guys get all uh, technical and, and anal about having their edge like be a toothy edge so that it cuts through more stuff or whatever. Sharp is sharp to us. Like, we want the knife out of the box to cut the first thing that you're going to cut, which is going to be paper, cardboard, whatever you have on hand. And then it's, it's a long-lasting edge. This is how we do all of our knives and always have... You know, er Eric learned what sharp is on the Wicked Edge, um, and now he's just matching that on the grinder, and it's, they're almost sharper, I think. I think they are sharper. Yeah. I couldn't get as consistently perfect as I do with the belt. Which is surprising. It's surprising, but maybe that's just me being crazy. But then again, for a consumer, like a, an end user that wants to buy a sharpening system, they're not going to buy or build a grinder. Well, you could use a 1x42, but you know what I mean. Wicked Edge is a great system just for a production shop like we're trying to do. It's not the most effective use of time. And Eric sharpened my knife, um, like two months ago maybe, on the grinder. Yeah. And uh, it's still insanely sharp. I still cut everything with it every day. And I actually put a nick in it because I hit a piece of ceramic accidentally. And it still cuts through like paper and slices through whatever I want to cut through. I mean, these aren't hard use knives. You're not going to break a car window by stabbing this through it. You could, but we just want a good sharp edge that's going to cut daily chores, you know, and be impressive. So, that's sharp. Yeah. Sharp talk with Grimms and Knives. <laughs> All right, the other thing I want to talk about is a box of parts that we just got back from the tumbler. Um, the tumbler basically puts this awesome stonewashed finish on all the parts using an enormous vibratory finishing machine. And so here's what's left in the box. What are you laughing about? It just sounds like a lady device. Moving on. 
Um, as you can see, before we sent them to the lady device, we um, put earplugs in, cut them in half, and put them in the pivot holes to try to prevent the handles from um, sticking together. Because like big flat surface on big flat surface in a wet, um, you know, in a wet tub, they stick together, and then they just sort of rub and scrape, and then you get ugly finishes like that, or like that especially, this one's horrendous. You know, and stuff like that is completely unacceptable, it needs to be re-tumbled, or just polished up and orange peeled or something. See, the back side's fine. That one's not bad. But yeah, um, it happens. These even had earplugs in them and it still gave that crappy finish. But more often than not, they turned out better. And then, gotta be careful with the earplugs that they don't stick out too far, because you can see that ring around the pivot hole that didn't get tumbled. And I don't know yet if that's going to be acceptable or not. It does look kind of dumb. Otherwise, it's got a perfect finish to it. Uh, well, we have been using this same shop to tumble our handles for the past, like, two years now. And they're, they're really great. They do a good job. Um, there's, there's things I don't like about it. Because, for one, they're 30 minutes away. So it's 30 minutes there, 30 minutes back, just to drop off parts. 30 minutes there, 30 minutes back, just to pick up parts. That's two hours of travel time just to get this stuff done. Plus, they're charging us per hour. I, I um, tell them two hours of tumbling time. So that's two hours of time. Um, luckily, we're in a barter system so that I'm trading them a knife. Like, I traded them one of my Tor fixed blades for a few previous batches, and now we're working up towards uh, giving the guy there, the head guy, a Norseman. So it's kind of... It's not free for me because I'm still giving them time and money and parts, but it's cheaper. But still, with the two hours of travel time and the hassle, that the mental block of not wanting to drive that far um, just to drop off parts and stop production and work and all that, it's kind of a big deal. And then, of course, we're trying to always rack up parts so that we have the most parts we can bring to them. And uh, it just it, things don't happen as fast as they should. So the solution is to get our own tumbler, and up until the, uh, just a few months ago this summer, I didn't think there were any good tumbler options um, that I liked anyway. Like we've got one of those Harbor Freight bowl tumblers about this big. Actually, I got it from Eastwood, um, and it's you know it's about this big. It holds 10, 20 pounds of media or something, 10 maybe, five, 10. I don't know. Um, it's just not powerful, it doesn't give us a good finish, and it doesn't do, you know, dozens and dozens of handles like we're doing. Um, you can maybe fit five to ten in there at a time, and even with a 24-hour tumble time, it's still not giving us a good finish, so I was not happy with that solution. Um, you can get bigger ones of those, like Brian Ty has this big one, it's about a thousand bucks, a Burr King, and uh, it's a bowl, and it works okay for him. He gets a pretty good finish, but he leaves it overnight. Um, and then of course there's like the big ones that uh, guys like Joe Caswell and Strider Knives has the one and I don't know what one Hinderer has but I know he's got something big. You know they're big ones, they're thousands or tens of thousands of dollars and that's kind of ridiculous for us. That's what my tumbler shop has, those big ones, right? So we don't want that, we don't want this machine in the corner making all kinds of noise all day long, whatever. Um, but just recently I learned about this one from northerntool.com um, I forget the brand name or shop name or whatever, but I'll put it in. Um, but it's like $800, and it's this rectangle box that, uh, it's not a bowl, so it doesn't vibrate, it just, it's a box that kind of just goes, rotates around and around and around. And um, I know Brad Southern has one of those, my good friend. Um, one of my new buddies, Kelsey, has just got one, and uh, he did a bunch of um, pry bars and knuckles with that, and the finish turned out really good after just one hour of tumbling time. So Brad told me, titanium handles, 30 minutes. A blade, like a, a hard blade like S90V, two hours. So that's the kind of time I can work with. And it's big enough that we can put probably 20, 30 parts in there, like pairs of parts, and it would work, which is just great for us. 
And for $800 plus shipping plus media, so I'm looking at like maybe $1,200 to get myself started with that tumbler. Um, I think that's definitely on the short list. Like within a few weeks, you'll be seeing that here. Because then if we have crappy ones turn out, we can just, oh darn, throw them back in, go inside for dinner, and you know, an hour later, they're perfect again. So that's kind of the plan. I'm gonna get one of those Northern Tool tumblers and live life happy again. And then we can do smaller batches and quicker batches and not have this waiting period, this headache of, oh, we gotta get all this stuff ready, we gotta find time to take it to the tumbler and blah, 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 blah. So, and then we can try different media. We can try different amounts of water and soap. All right, so the ceramic tumbling media comes in all different shapes and sizes and grits and whatever. Um, here's one kind that we've been using. So I think this would be like a 5 8 pyramid or something. They all have funky names and stuff. Um, my tumbling shop has been using this one to tumble my handles. That's what gave us this finish in their enormous tumbler. And I'm relatively happy with that. If you do your research, you can find out what other knife makers are using. Um, Hinder has got a picture floating around, I think on his Facebook page or something. Or Monkey Edge's Facebook page. I think they did a tour of the shop that uh, it shows Hinderer's tumbler and what kind of media he uses. So before I buy media, I'm gonna ask around to all my buddies and, and see what's the best one that everybody's happy with for doing titanium and blades. You know, whether it's a more sharper one like this or a duller one like this and how big and whatnot because you gotta think with my honeycomb pockets, this, these big edges, they don't get inside there. So if you look in the corners of the honeycomb, it's not getting tumbled which is kind of cool, I kind of like it like that. It's a good two-tone, like super shiny in the corners and then tumbled in the center of that honeycomb. I kind of like that. Same for the lock bar here. The flat is tumbled, but inside that radius corner is not tumbled, which is kind of cool. So all these little tricks, you know, if we have our own tumbler, we can try different size media, we can try different amounts of media. You know, we can try 20 pounds of media or 100 pounds of media and the more weight the more churning action it has on these parts. And since having a good finish and making the knife look just perfect is really important to us, um, yeah, it's an investment that has to be made. Oh darn, more tools. So one thing I'm working on right now is to shorten more screws. You can see all the little bits of screw right there. Um, when I buy the, shoe, the screws, they are a quarter inch long, I need to, them to be one eighth inch long. So when I first started making these Norseman knives, I took an extra piece of RWL blade steel and uh, I just drilled and tapped a bunch of holes. I used a um, thread form tap. These ones just finished. So I'm using an end mill to chop them down. I can get about 87 screws on this dinky little plate. They take a long time to load up though, even using the drill. Probably like five to ten minutes just to load each one up. They're faster to unload. But yeah, I just put them in and have the end mill come by and buzz, 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 buzz. Using a sharp end mill is key, so I've got a relatively brand new four flute here from Lakeshore Carbide. And it's getting dull because, I mean, these are hardened stainless steel, so they're a bit abrasive on the, on the end mill. But I used a dull end mill yesterday and uh, Eric was all mad because he couldn't get the burrs off because it was just it folded them over instead of cut them off cleanly so we basically had a patch of these that didn't work out but yeah and then from here we just um, let me zoom out we just take the whole plate over to our scotch bread wheel turned on and just buzz them all like this and that gets all the burrs off but yeah, so that works out great. I haven't even bothered to make a bigger plate yet because this just seems to work. Not sufficiently epic? No. It's 
like just almost gummy, but almost ridiculously smooth at the same time. <laughs> it's like right in the middle. Yeah. I haven't looped the detent ball, but... So you're saying it drops, but it doesn't drop with the effortless glide that it should. Yeah, like I'm not worried about losing the tip of my finger yet. Yeah. Some of the knives we put together lately are just insane like that. That's good enough. A pretty sweet color combo there. Yeah. Purple and carbon fiber, etched blade, silver hardware. Yeah. Looks like Eric B, this one's yours, and uh, prepare to be sufficiently amazed. I don't think we ever showed the etching stickers. No, I guess not. So when Eric does his uh, acid etching of the blades, like this one is, You can see where the ball bearings go and where the detent ball scrapes. We got these wicked stickers made up that cover that up before etching. Um, in here? Yeah, no. etch stickers. In here. Can you open that for me? So they're basically just little round discs that are a vinyl sticker. Beautiful. That uh, you just kind of eyeball on there, right? And yeah, put them up to the light and make sure the pivot hole is on. And, and put one on each side. Yep. And then I nail polish in the pivot right. to keep that sealed. Nice. And on the lock face. Yep. What about the stop pin hole? Do you do that? Yes. And on the stop pin open and closed position. So yeah, he masks off all of that so that none of it gets affected during etching and then all the tolerances are exactly where I set them to when I machined everything. And the knife is still smooth as butter when yeah. you put it together. Because before we'd etch it and then put it together and it was just so horrible. You yeah. felt all the little pits. And... It feels like sandpaper. Just... Yeah. And uh, no offense to other knife makers, but I've seen guys do that. And when the detent ball is scraping on its severely etched surface, it just feels horrendous. Mm -hmm. Whereas ours are, it's like floating on magnets. Now. Now. We did have a few that uh, yeah. were not so good. Yeah, but we learned. Right now Eric's just putting on some Loctite 242. Little dab. That's a lot, actually. Yeah. Dab will do ya. Could also put it on a Q-tip or something and then Dab like it on. In the hole? Yeah, or just on the threads. That's what Brian Fellholter said. He uses this uh, gel Loctite that uh, he puts a little bit on the end of a Q-tip and puts it inside the hole of the threads, not on the screw threads themselves, and then does it like that. So as far as the shop layout, I mean, it's starting to get cluttered with junk again, which tends to happen, but... So we got our little random... The sign of genius, right? The sign of genius, I like that. We got a little random table right here for uh, Eric does his etching there. Um, in the corner we have a top secret machine that we haven't done any videos on and I feel really guilty about that. But uh, we will shoot one very soon and describe what on earth is going on in that corner because it's a pretty awesome corner. But I want to do a good video about that. That was just a teaser. So the mill's over here, tool chest, and Lathe over here that I never, ever, ever use anymore. It's just become a junk table. Um, but this is my little assembly station. And while it might seem kind of goofy, it's on pear crates and a little cheesy plywood top and everything. I really like it because it's at uh, about my, my waist level. You know, my belt is right here, so it's, it's at a good height, like higher than most tables so that I can stand here and be comfortable, you know, just lower than my elbow height, so that my hands are comfortable here and I'm not leaning over, I'm a tall guy at 6'1", so it's just comfortable having a tall table like this. And then this is my assembly station, so these are my little assembly tools, my extra reamers and chamfer tools for deburring, you know, tough glide, lapping compound. 
um, and then I put together these little cases with um, all the knife parts in them. You know, the blade, the handles, the spacers, the screws. Each knife takes seven screws. Um, the stop pin. And sometimes I'll put in the thumb stud and the lock bar stabilizer, but sometimes I'll just make Eric do that at the end. And then I write these little thingies, you know, with all my notes, the guy's name and all his, uh, his details. So like, like this guy wants honeycomb blue knife, blue anodized sanded flats and edges, hand tumble it afterwards, which is something we don't do often. Um, bronze clip, bronze hardware, stonewash blade, and ceramic bearings. So it just kind of tells me everything I need to know to assemble the knife. And I cut them up into little thingies so that I just put each one in each thingy so that it's pretty easy. I'm, I'm kind of liking this system. And then all the knife parts stay in its own little thing. And um, In the near future, I do want to do an assembly video, like, like a setup video, where I go from, you know, these are right out of the tumblers, stone washed parts. They're all deburred and everything, but they're not set up yet. There's still some reaming that I have to do. There's still some chamfering of important holes and stuff. In the blade, I have to, uh, since it's now been heat treated and finished, I have to ream out the pivot hole to the proper size. And then I have to um, set up the detent, set up the detent and the lockup on the knife to make them flip and lock up the way that they do. So I want to do a really good video about that, um, describing how I do that, because some of you knife makers, guys getting into it and stuff, could learn from my process, even though it's heavily CNC based. Um, yeah. Another quick teaser, when I do set up that video, I want to describe what these are. These are called gauge pins, and they're very precision ground on a centerless grinder and then laser etch. This is 0 0.188 and this is 0 0.1875 so I have five tenths increments and I actually got a lot more than this but it turns out I only need this range um, not even this whole range. I really only use the 1875 and 188 pins sometimes the smaller one, 1870 but yeah so I'll go over that in, in that video, but quick teaser. So there we have it guys, that'll do it for this week. I want to thank you all for watching. And um, in response to my video, my previous video that I did about doing the phone calls, um, I've had hundreds of emails with people's phone numbers in there and everybody's attaching a super nice little note that says, you know, I just love what you're doing, love watching the videos. I have some Norsemans and they're just, reading those emails is very flattering. Um, so I want to thank you guys for sending those in. Uh, it's very heartwarming. Um, so yeah, a couple more specific detailed videos that I want to get into in the near future. And um, just keep on keeping on. All you Norseman customers waiting for a knife right now, like I said, we're finishing knives almost every single day. So uh, you'll hear from me soon. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Bye.